Welcome to the show, Gold Squadron Gays. It's the podcast where two Star Wars loving gays talk about and review their favorite Star Wars content while also being gay as hell. I'm your host, Bradley Brower. I'm your other host, Charles Rogers, and today is a special episode. Isn't it, Bradley? Is it? A lot of special episodes. In fact, it's so special it's come around to being mundane again. Oh, okay. Well, of that I can agree with. <laughs> nothing interesting has happened this episode. It's no significant milestone marker. Definitely nothing happened this week that we need to talk about. Let's see. Is it... Oh, God. Is it already February? It is It is already. By the time you are hearing this episode... Let me see exactly what day you will be hearing this episode. It is already February 5th, which oh. means that a few days ago marked the three-year anniversary of the day that Bradley texted me to say, hey, so I screwed up in the uploading. And our first episode is live. Love a that. story which I will tell every year because it every remains year. funny. It's I love still it. Fun. Uh, yeah, we've been making this show for three years now. Why? <laughs> because we have nothing better to do. I hate it. Why are we doing this still? Um... Because you're really opinionated, and I'm also really opinionated. So true. We need an and outlet. We, 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 we do. That actually kind of is how the show started. <laughs> Truthfully, it was. Bradley and I used to talk about Star Wars all the time, and at one point we were just like, why don't we just do this into a microphone for attention? Because right. we're gay. Because, like, if, see, the difference is, the difference between millennials and Gen Z is right here. Millennials are like, you know what? I'm going to start a podcast because I want everybody to know my thoughts. Gen Z is going to go, I'm going to get on my fucking TikTok and just tell everybody anyway, regardless of if they want to know or not. <laughs> and you know, Which the, is sad, similar. the sad part is, the sad part is that Gen Z are on TikTok is going to get way more views. Way more views than we are. That's <laughs> Way for more views sure. than we are. So good for them. Good uh, for them. Yeah, it's, you no, know, it's been fun. I think after three years, the show has settled into a really nice groove. I think we've... We've attracted a great deal of really cool listeners uh, who are constantly giving me feedback and constantly engaging, which is awesome. It's just it's just a fun show to make at the end of the day. Like, it's fun to get on here every week and go, OK, so we're going to bitch about Ahsoka now. And we're not taking it too seriously. Like, I think yeah. I think that's why it's good. I, otherwise, people would be like, wow, you guys are like really like serious. Like, you're like, wow, uh, so her. intense. Yeah, like the color of that lightsaber is not the right shade of blue. Like, you know, we're not like that, you know, so it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's important. And I, I have this ethos in everything I do that r- relates to Star Wars. You know, even when I'm being critical of it, one of my ethos is, you guys know this is supposed to be fun, right? You know, you're supposed to have fun with it. And if you're not having fun with it, you really should be doing something else. And so that's that's what makes me so irritated in part about all those like hate click youtubers and things like that i'm like you guys clearly do not enjoy this stuff you clearly do not enjoy talking about star wars you do it for the money but you clearly hate it go do something else with your time yeah it's such a waste of time like go 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 do something fun you're gonna die at some point you might as well fill your life with joy and so I really enjoyed making the show. It has been an incredible three years so far. Can't wait to see how unhinged we become when the Acolyte comes out. Oh my god. Yeah, We're going to go insane. I mean, I was gonna, you know, I wanna, I can't jinx ourselves because it's way too soon, but I was like, whenever that trailer inevitably drops, which will probably not even be until like May, I'm gonna go crazy. Because I know everybody at Celebration already saw it, but I didn't see it. I, I may have seen parts of the Celebration trailer somehow, not saying how and i mean i'm very excited to get a look at this show i know this show is going to be for us specifically i'm ready i'm Mm -hmm. ready speaking of things that are us for us specifically it's a reminder we record these episodes and then they come out on about a nine-ish day turnaround time but if you listen to episode four you know that we kind of jinxed ourselves last recording in when we way. said, when we were like, oh, the, the the Bad Batch trailer might come out, we might have to record a stinger, uh, and then I, I inevitably had to record a stinger uh, to be inserted into the episode, <laughs> because, Bradley, what did you think of the Bad Batch season three trailer? You know, at first, I was like, oh, okay, this is okay. I was like, this looks kind of fun, I guess, you know, like they're finally it, it, it's time to end. Right. Like it, the time it's over. It's good. It looks like they're about to like kind of wrap everything up in a nice little pretty bow. 
And then they decided to literally slap you across the face with the very last blip of the trailer where they're like, character revealed, slap, slap, slap. This character is not alive. How is she here? I don't understand what's going on. My brain is broken. <laughs> uh, yes. So if you have not watched the trailer, go and watch the trailer and then come back. Because I, I'm about to tell my impression, not of watching the trailer, because I had the same one as you, but of showing my partner the trailer. Mm. Because I raced home and I was like, we're watching the Bad Bad trailer immediately. This man is in his house coat. He is off work. He is lounging. He was like, what? <laughs> what? Huh? I was like, no, shut up. We're going to watch the trailer. Dragged him into the main room, literally turned him around and like stood him in the kitchen. It was like, you stand there while I put the trailer on because I don't even want you seeing the thumbnail of the trailer. He's oh like, oh, okay. Like, what the fuck? So I'm sitting there and I'm pulling it up. And of course, you know what thumbnail they put on all of the trailers. You know which one they put up there. So I load one of them up and I pause it and I bring him into the room and I hit play. And Bradley's right. The first two minutes or so of the trailer is standard Bad Batch military thriller fare. It's the Bad Batch is doing cool things. The Bad Batch is uh, Omega is still in the prison. Uh, we're reminded that our shitty Joseph Mengele character is here. Finnick Shand is back. Cad Bane is back. These things are cool. And my partner's just sitting there like, okay, like, this is fine. Like, this is the term he would use is aggressively okay. Yeah. He's like, this is aggressively okay. Like, yes. cut to black. Again, spoilers for the trailer. It, this is your last chance. Back out now if you haven't watched it yet or somehow don't know. Fucking Asajj Ventress starts speaking, and I swear my partner's jaw hit the floor. He had an all. This man is not even a real, like, I don't want to say real Star Wars fan. He's not a really big Star Wars fan. This man's jaw hit the floor. He was like, wait, what the fuck? What the fuck just happened? Isn't she dead? <laughs> and I went, yeah, I have no more information than you do, honey. Ugh. They did go on. Uh, the article that announces the Bad Batch, they did ask Brad Rao fucking what? And his response was like, no, 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 no. We know about Dark Disciple. We're not retconning Dark Disciple. That's like the only piece of information in the article besides the Bad Batch just coming back is we're not retconning Dark Disciple, which, okay, good. But what does that mean? <laughs> but what does that mean, Brad? <laughs> what does that mean? It, like, that, that's like, like, that's word vomit to me because that's like, okay, what I don't understand what that means. Like, because we're not, the, we're the going exact to honor... quote is like, it, we're going to respect the storytelling that was done in Dark Disciple was like the actual wording that he used. So basically he's saying we're not going to pretend the novel didn't happen. Right. And like, Okay, side note, the novel fucking skyrocketed up in the Amazon sales list after this. Oh, really? It went from like, let me see, because the, the book's author, Christy Golden, was tweeting about it, which, you know, good for good Christy. For her. Get her bag. Get her bag uh, as a result of this. Let me find the last one. So according to her Twitter on January the 23rd, which was four days ago as of recording this episode, it, it went in 24 hours from rank 100K on Amazon to, or within its category, to, or for overall books. No, it went from rank like 100K or something to 326th. Wow. Overall. Power of Star Wars, baby. Yep. Because everybody was like, we got to read this book to understand what the fuck is going on. Right, everybody's like, they're going to read it and be like, we don't understand what the fuck is going on. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, I thought about it. I was like, I don't think reading the book is going to help you understand what's going on in season three, (laughs) other than just having a knowledge of that it happened. Like, I don't really know what else it's going to do for you. So Bradley, how are you personally feeling? (laughs) I may or may have not teared up a little bit, one, watching it, and two, listening to you talk about it again. Because it's just... I, I. I never thought, like, I, I genuinely am I'm in the mindset of, I, you know, everybody likes to pretend, or at least Star Wars likes to pretend, Lucasfilm likes to pretend that Asajj Ventress never existed. I don't know why. She just is gone forever and left into the ethos of Star Wars. And it's just so nice that they're, like, bringing her back. Like, it's like, thank God. Like, I, I just love so much Asajj Ventress. And the fact that they're bringing her back is just like, yes, thank you. Finally, fucking bring her back. Exactly what we needed. <laughs> I, I tweeted out on on our official Gold Squadron account, I tweeted out this 
this image of like it's a girl holding a volleyball and she's getting ready to throw it at two of her friends and the two friends in the background have the label random users on the internet trying to be funny and the ball is labeled apollo with the gift of prophecy because i think you and i have been what we thought was safely making they're gonna bring asajj ventress back jokes for three years yeah like i think we've been making these jokes since the inception of the podcast because I don't think either of us really thought they'd do it. Right. <laughs> and I never, then they my did do it. it. And we're both just like, okay, so those were jokes. To be clear, Lucasfilm, those were jokes. That was not the part of this you were supposed to be doing. I have so many like thoughts racing in my head of like, what does this mean? Just because it's in, you know, cartoon form, what however Bad Batch theoretically ends could lead to, well, if she is alive and it's not just a flashback or whatever like what does that mean for the future of the mandalorian stuff like and the night sister stuff and like all kinds of stuff like who knows so i i have a sort of a fun fact for you this is not the first time they've talked about bringing asajj ventress back now you don't know this because you haven't watched past the first couple of episodes of resistance uh there's a character later in resistance who turns up who's like this old woman who's like she hunts for force artifacts, basically, and she's running around. Uh, originally, that was supposed to be Asajj Ventress returned from the dead. Uh, but they were like, no, nah, we can't really make this work. So they'd apparently talked about it before. It's conceivable she could be running around by the time of the sequel trilogy now. Some There's, there's a whole bunch of theories because Mount Tantus is involved. So the theory is maybe she's a clone. I don't think so. She has the lightsaber. It would be weird to me if if she didn't have her book accurate lightsaber. I don't know. Then there's some people saying like, oh, it might be Night Sister magic. There's some people saying she had a snorkel during her burial. Shut up. She was just she's she was just dead waiting for days. What do you mean? She's just waiting in the water. <laughs> she's just waiting in the water for Quinlan and Obi Wan to go away. Oh my god. It's crazy because we also know Quinlan Voss is alive. Right. Which. I know we were joking about a path show, but I'm like, what if? I'm just hearing. Look, they're just shoveling all these characters off to the side that are so interesting that are involved in the path. You have Reva, you have Roken, you have Quinlan Voss, you have now potentially Asajj Ventress. And I'm like, where's, where's the path? Why are you giving me all these movies that I'm indifferent about? Give me the path show. You want to do shit on Disney Plus? Disney, give me my path show. Well, we can't keep talking about Asajj Ventress forever, mostly because we've hit the limit that we set for ourselves exactly. at the start of the episode. It was a teaser Brother. for our Bad Batch Episode Zero. Yes. There you go. Our Bad Batch Episode Zero coming eventually. Bradley, what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about Ahsoka Episode 5, Part 5, titled shadow warrior where ahsoka confronts her past while hera and her allies undertake a rescue mission charles what is one thing about this episode you liked and one thing you did not so one thing about this episode that i liked was how understated the flashbacks were with the production design and i i think it speaks to because they very clearly could have done these big clone wars battles right they could have had that happening in the background they could have had this big camp full of Republic soldiers while Ahsoka and Anakin are having their conversation. They opted not to do that. Every flashback is very misty. It's very vague. It's very like a memory. It's very, it keeps the focus on Anakin and Ahsoka. We're not overwhelmed by a bunch of stuff happening in the background. Everything that's in the background is evoking a sense of a memory of a big event without being a big event. And this is every single one of the, the, in Ahsoka's head moments uh, from the two Clone Wars flashbacks to the the three Clone Wars flashbacks or so to the stuff in the world between worlds itself. All of it is designed really well to keep our focus on Ahsoka and Anakin. So it's really great production design, really great direction, just really good choices to keep that focus on these three actors doing their thing which is really the core of the show is actors having these interactions with each other one thing i didn't like this episode has a big major structural problem this episode has ass structure this episode just from beginning to end looking at it from the start to the end is probably the worst one in terms of just how disconnected the scenes are from each other just how disconnected and i'll note it there's a specific note thing in my notes where I will point out where I think the episode should have been cut 
and should have been moved to a different episode. I made the mistake of saying this right after the show aired and everybody was riding the high, but I do, I'm bringing it up again here and I'm going to bring it up at the specific point because it is a criticism that I've continued to have of this particular episode. And I kind of understand now having rewatched it, what they were going for, but it's not really, it doesn't feel right to me. It feels like it should have been two episodes. It not one. It feels like it should have been two 22 minute episodes that we're missing some of that cohesion between the two. What about you, Bradley? One thing you liked and one thing you did not. And you can't say Hayden Christensen. One thing I liked was not Hayden Christensen at all. I liked young Ahsoka. Um, I thought <laughs> casting for this person was so good. I didn't know I needed young Ahsoka until I saw this in live action. Um, it was so good because in my brain, you know, Rosario Dawson Ahsoka is adult Ahsoka to me. And then Ashley Eckstein is the cartoon slash teen version in my brain. Like I can separate the two. They're two totally different versions of the character and it's fine. Did I know I wanted young live action Ahsoka until this person showed up? No, I did not. And now I do. And I want more. And it's amazing. What I did not like about this episode, I did not like that. I, I think it's kind of, I think it blends into the structuring I just, it should have just all been the flashbacky stuff. I don't think you needed any of the other stuff. It's, I get what they were doing when they kind of switch back, but it's kind of like, why? We ne- like, they're just waiting around for Ahsoka to finish her flashbacks. So it's like, what's the point? Like, it doesn't really make any sense other than like a beginning and an end kind of thing. There's um, one specific scene. There's really only one scene that ties the outside the real world stuff to the world between world stuff and it is one of the coolest scenes we'll get there when we'll get there but really only that one scene ties them together right i think that was just yeah you're right i think it's just a structure thing but yeah all right well bradley you want to take us into ahsoka episode five part five shadow warrior not to be confused with the clone wars episode of the same name Ooh, not a little trivia at the beginning of the episode yeah, there is also, I forget what it's about. Let me Google real yeah, You know, the what's Clone funny is when I, was look, when I looked it up, Warrior. I had no idea what the plot was. I saw that it was a thing, and I was like, there's no plot here. Like, I don't know what the plot <laughs> Yeah, so if you're curious, the Clone Wars episode, Shadow Warrior, that's the one that's set on Naboo, and it is about the Gungans uh, having their leader be... A separatist or manipulated by separatists, something to that effect. I'm just sort of skimming the plot Blazing details because <laughs> I vaguely. This is the one where Anakin gets captured and he has to be exchanged for General Grievous. So no relation at all. So n- no real relation. <laughs> they just both happen to be called Shadow Warrior. Interesting. Section one. We begin on Cetos where Hera, Jason, and Chopper land the ghosts at the reflex point where they find Hu Yang holding Sabine's helmet and reflecting on his advice to Ahsoka to stay together. Title card, part five, Shadow Warrior. It's a tiny note, but I like that the map is shown to have gears, like actual clockwork gears. It's mechanical in nature, but it's also magic somehow. It's I like it. It gives it a sense. It gives it a sense of like oldness. It gives it a sense of age. It gives it a sense of a technology that existed prior. So many iterations prior to the technology that the galaxy is using now that the art to make that technology has been lost. Yeah, it's very steampunk Star Wars. Like, I don't right. know. It's, it's nice. It's, or what's the, um, in Dungeons and Dragons, what is it called where you have a, a robot thing that's like possessed by a spirit? Uh, a, a golem? No, isn't that like a mud thing? I'm talking about like a robot. Fuck, I thought it was a, a like a robot. A, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Anyway, I think it's like a class. I'm going to get yelled at, by the way, for Automaton. this. Automaton. Oh, there it cool. is, automaton. Yeah, you're Thank right. You. I'm gonna get yelled at for this bit, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, wait, you. don't you have a D and D podcast? I have a Star Wars Five E podcast. I'm not that familiar with the D and D lore, actually. It's oh, never really? really appealed to me until I started playing Baldur's Gate Three. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, robots that are possessed that are steampunky in nature. It just gave me that vibe of like the kind of like vintage, but it's robots, but it's like still old somehow. Like it's, I don't know. They did a good job. With it. Yeah, no, I really like this this design choice for this thing. I do also like the interaction between Jason and Chopper in this scene, where Chopper is clearly very super protective of Jason, but also 
Chopper is clearly trusted very heavily by Hera to take care of Jason because it, she's like, you know, stay close to Chopper. Let Chopper watch you. Don't get too far from Chopper. And at first in my brain, I'm like, what is Chopper going to do? And then I remembered what Chopper does over the course of Rebels. And I'm like, oh, no, right. that kid's fine. I was like, he's murdered that many kid's people. Fine. So he's OK. <laughs> he's, now, to be fair, he's only killed tens of thousands of people and they were fascists. But yes, Chopper has a body count in the five digits. I think Jason's going to be OK. I think he'll be fine. I did also really love the shot of Jason hiding behind Chopper and like peeking out. That was so funny. We're going to get like some kind of uh, I need like a not a short, but like a road trip thing, like episode where it's just Chopper and Jason just together, like stuck on an eye, like stuck on a planet together somehow. Like, <laughs> see, if this were an animated show, you could get away with doing that. You could have a 20 minute episode that's just Chopper and Jason, a bottle episode somewhere. Yeah. Like, I would watch the shit out of that episode, actually. Or they could just throw Jason in the Skeleton Crew uh, show for no reason whatsoever. Oh my god, they totally should throw Jason in the Skeleton Why Crew show. Why is he not in that show? Jason's gonna show up in Skeleton Crew and be infinitely more competent than everyone else in the room. He's gonna be the kid that shows up and it's just like, yeah, I know how to do this completely. My mom is Harrison Dula. Right. I hang out with the war crimes robot. <laughs> For fun. I casually talk to Ahsoka Tano. Like, she's basically my aunt. You know, she's basically my aunt. (laughs) I know what I'm doing. (laughs) David Tennant delivering the line I told them to stay together, but they never listen. First of all, David Tennant, Emmy again for this immediately. Like, good God, this man's voice. But also the way it cracks, that specific line, you can tell that that line's not just about Ahsoka and Sabine. You can tell it's about all the Jedi. That he's always telling them stay together, and they split up across the galaxy to fight the Clone Wars. They didn't stay together, and they got destroyed. Every time the Jedi have split up in some form, or they've become stretched too thin, or they've... And it's it's got to be tragic for Hu Yang, who's thousands of years old. And we know from some of the comics... We know that it's been established that the Jedi Order has not been exactly the same for thousands of years. There's points where it's almost been completely wiped out in the past. And so for Hu Yang to have to constantly see this on both a massive scale and to this small scale with Ahsoka and Sabine, that has to be fucking hard for him. Now, I only have one real note about this scene, and it's not to take away from his acting, which is amazing for a sentient robot, which is like, what? How, like, I I don't understand his logic in that he finds a Sabine's helmet, but they're both missing. So, like, how does he know they're not together? Uh, Most likely because he found Sabine's helmet. Yeah, but that doesn't negate Sabine would never Sabine would never willingly leave her helmet behind. And if she's in trouble, Ahsoka probably wasn't around. Yeah, but I just, the logic isn't logicking. Because, like, if that's the case, let's just say, for example. It is a good point. He thinks that Sabine got captured naturally. I would assume Ahsoka went to go go after her. Like, I don't know. I, did, I don't see how, how he's logicking that they're separated. As far as he knows, they should be, they could have been both captured. We don't know the situation. He wasn't there. Yeah, that is an excellent point. I, don't, I wonder if he, because he clearly didn't do, I wonder if he did some sort of scan or something. But then Ahsoka has to do her psychometry thing later. I don't know. It's it's a nice moment, but you're right. It is kind of a minor question that I have of how does he know they were separated if they don't know where Ahsoka is. The rest of the episode is then trying to find Ahsoka. My only my here's my only bullshit. Did they mention like, in the last episode that they know Sabine's on the ship? No, no, they, they have no idea what happened to her. They have no idea what happened to her. Th- that's because that's why Ahsoka has to do her little thing, because they have no idea where she is. So my my bullshit reason is that Sabine's helmet has some kind of recorder or something in it. Hu Yang is able to access the recording of her talking to Balin, and then he sees that she went with Balin, and then Ahsoka fell off the cliff, and he just knows that somehow. I don't know. Yeah, that's, my that's, bullshit. that's the only bullshit I can think of, too, is that yeah. if the helmet has some sort of short-term recording and he saw right. Ahsoka go off the cliff. I don't think we're meant to think too much about it. I think we're meant to, to be distracted by the dangly, shiny things. But we've been <laughs> making this podcast for three years, and these are the types of questions we now notice. Yes. Yeah, it's nothing. Or as I say, Bradley um, now notices. I've okay. always thought like this. I was going to say, it's nothing on Dave's writing. I just like, it, you know, I love to logic where logic is not logicking. Okay. 
I just love to do this it. This is the day. type of thing. This is the type of thing that if we were to get a novelization of the Ahsoka show, they would probably have some bullshit to figure. Out. Did I ever tell you how they find Kylo Ren in the forest in the Force Awakens in the Force Awakens novelization? Oh, before it explodes. Before it fucking explodes. <laughs> yeah, no, I just assumed he just. According to the him. novel, from what I understand and what I remember of it, Hux puts a tracker on him. Oh Hux God. just sort of has a tracker on Kylo Ren so he can find him at any point. And then they're like, oh, Hux had this tracker on him somehow. And it's yeah, like, but even then, it. that doesn't make sense because he hated him. So he. Would rather <laughs> stop just leave and him think to about die. it for five yeah. minutes. You're like, that makes no sense. But okay, sure. The the plot has to plot. Yes, of course. Section 2. In the world between worlds, Ahsoka Tano encounters the spirit of Anakin Skywalker who claims to be there to finish her training after her loss to Balin Skull. He engages her in a lightsaber duel, and meanwhile, at the Henge, Hera, Hu Yang, and Carson Tiva suspect Ahsoka and Sabine might be with Morgan. Jason notices something unusual in the water, claiming to hear lightsaber battle, and Hera confirms the sounds. She orders Tiva to launch a sweep. Oh, so now the de-aging looks good. <laughs> yes, it looks fantastic. That, that was my first thought. The second we got out of that initial angle, I think it really was the angle and the lighting. The second we got out of that initial angle and lighting, it was like, oh, yeah, no, now this looks great. Now this looks, it looks a little smooth in the world between worlds. I think, sure. again, that's the lighting. But they're managing to capture a lot of Hayden's acting. Yeah, I mean, it's. They did such a good job to the point where, like, I mean, this is no hate on Hayden at all. Like, I think he looks great um, now anyway. But, I mean, he is older. Like, that's just, that's natural. He is older. He looks different than he did right. when he played Anakin. That He's is, not going to look like a teen. A yeah. <laughs> they, so. they are both, they are both very pretty versions of Hayden Christensen for different reasons. Exactly. And I think they did such a good job. Like, I wouldn't mind seeing this again. Like, I wouldn't mind them using him just constantly in the future just like just to do more anakin appearances for whatever reason if it has to make sense obviously but you know it can't he just can't just be there to talk to the skeleton force crew ghost for no anakin reason. in season two yeah force ghost anakin in season two let's right. go let's go come on i mean why not it, he should out, be there the whole the time it up. <laughs> no it looks fucking amazing clearly like they poured they poured so much money into this like specifically this episode and i recall when this episode came out i was a little bummed because they put it out in theaters which normally i would have gone and i would have seen it in the theater like that's the thing i would have done the strikes were on at the time and i didn't want to be used for promotion because i knew that if i went if i go and i buy a ticket but it's to this fan event i'm tacitly consenting by purchasing the ticket to having my photo taken video taken and having that used for promotional purposes for the show and i couldn't stomach that at the time and still can't however if they were to re-release this in the theater i would fucking go see it so quickly just to watch some of this on on the screen and i think they also kind of knew it was going to be watched on the big screen which is why they put so much into like the de-aging tech, oh, but yeah. it looks fucking great. I was going to say like uh, strikes aside, like from a marketing standpoint, a fan event with this episode in the theater is such a genius idea that like, because of God the damn it, the strikes ruined everything again. I know it's, it's, it was such a good idea. I mean, yes, it didn't work out because of the whole thing, but if the idea was fantastic, I mean, it makes so much sense. And you're just like, this is how you want to view this. And I think they were piloting in a way putting this on the big screen because they wanted to pilot in a sense like the return of you know kind of star wars to the theaters right. i think they were kind of like mm, let's just see what the reactions I, are like you know i had that theory at the time i had the theory at the time and i continue to maintain that part of what they were doing with that was testing the viability of releasing certain episodes into theaters for future shows that for particularly for Mar for Star Wars and Marvel shows, and most particularly Star Wars, whether they could actually get people to come out and go to your local theater and watch the episode. Maybe it's a one night only. Maybe it's like a Fathom Events or something. Does anybody even know what Fathom Events are anymore? Is that still a thing? I don't even know. Is Fathom that. Events still a thing? So Fathom Events used to be this type of thing. You would go to the theater in like the late aughts and you would see these advertisements for the Fathom events. And what they were was that they were these like stage shows that were broadcast onto the, I never went to one, but they were like stage shows that you could watch at your local movie theater. 
and they were like one or two night events that you could go to. I always saw the advertisements for them when I went to the theater, but I never actually watched one myself. Oh, I'm thinking yeah. that's what they were. That's what they're looking to try to do with maybe like sure the finale of a show or a really important episode of a show, something like that. Uh, yes, Anakin does say that he's here to finish Ahsoka's training, which little curious on that, because if we remember the episode where she leaves the Jedi Order, she leaves right as they're about to promote her to Jedi Knight. She doesn't technically need any more training from Anakin, but we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there when it's we get there. It's interesting that yeah. he says that. He also says one is never too old to learn, which is just a banger quote. And I then just liked it a lot. There's another quote. I don't know if you caught the other quote. That Ahsoka what? What's said. the other quote? Uh, Ahsoka says the line, I will not fight you, which is technically what Luke Skywalker says to Darth Vader in Return of the Jedi. And then Anakin responds with, I've heard that before. Yes, I have. <laughs> literally, you stole my next note out from under oh, me. That's so funny. I thought it was hilarious. I still find that line hilarious. Every time I watch this episode, I laugh at that line. Because I love because a also, like <laughs> I love a reference, but also he has a point. Luke ends up beating the shit out of him. Right. Luke is like, I will not fight you. And then five minutes later, he's beating the ever-loving fuck out of Darth <laughs> Vader in a Denny's parking lot with a lightsaber. No, it's it's crazy how much this episode is a love letter to Anakin Skywalker's character journey through the lens of Ahsoka Tano. Like, he's he's teaching her. It really is a sort of master Padawan dynamic because you can see everything that has happened to Anakin in his life and how he's trying to pass some of that down onto Ahsoka. It's fucking crazy. The first 25 minutes of this episode are so fucking good, it's insane. I love it. It's insane. I think we might have seen that scanner before. This is the thing Charles didn't research. This is such a small detail that I can't even, like, I didn't even have a chance to look at it. I think we've seen that scanner that Hera is using before. Ah. I think we've seen it in Empire. I'm not 100% certain on that, but I'm almost certain we've seen that scanner before. Because that's too big and clunky and 80s and stupid to... Right. It has to be a... Re like, and not it even has that, to or, be a reference to something. Yeah, either referenced or just so similar to something that they used. Yeah, this is the bio scanner from it. I looked at it for about a minute and I couldn't find it, but I did find an old picture of tagged from Legends of a rebel using a very similar device. So I can only imagine this is the same one we've seen elsewhere. It doesn't appear to have appeared in a film that I can tell, but I may be wrong about that. I'm almost certainly wrong about that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's from Empire. Anyway, notably the scanner. We get a name drop. We get a certain name drop in this who, episode, Bradley. Who, who, whose name do uh, they mention? Uh, they mention that they are being covered for in this mission by one Senator Organa. Still the senator and not having been ousted yet. She will not be ousted for another couple decades. And so she... I, I noted that this is the first mention of Leia within the Mandoverse. Yes. That's what, that's what it says mm -hmm. online. So I thought that was interesting. Yes, that is neat. That is very neat and cool. So love hearing her mention. Well, she'll come up a few times in the back half of this show. Uh, one notable time in particular. I like that she's being referenced as being around, but they they didn't try to show her. They didn't try to do the thing with her. Right. The way they get around this in episode seven is probably one of the more genius ways that they've gotten around actually showing a legacy character on screen. So I... I thought it was nice that she got a mention. I did not know she would continue to get mentions. So the time I was like, right. Yeah, this could have easily just been the only time they talked about it. And then it was just like, OK, that was a nice little like mention. But then it's like, no, nah, she's. Oh, no, this is kind of yeah. an important element of the plot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, shout out to Evan Witten's acting again. The way he acts this scene, it could be so dopey, but he does it so well. Like this kid legitimately has a lot of talent. And I like how he's playing it in a subtle way. I guess in a in essentially a Jedi-like way. Like everything's always like mystical and like kind of almost like reserved in a sense. He's not going like holding his hand out and going, I feel something weird happening. And he's just kind of like, something's going on. Like something, like I feel something weird. Like he's not like making a big dramatic like scene about it. It's just intuitive for him. Right. It's just him. He can feel it in his bones. Because he has that that degree of connection to the Force. 
And he's just like, I can sort of hear it. My next note is the shot from the back of Jason and Chopper and Hera is so fucking good. Like I had to pause on that shot. That's family shot of the three of them. It's fucking incredible. Then the music starts playing. Shout out to Kevin Kiner's fucking score again. And correct me, like I'm I'm wondering, so in this scene, Jason hears the lightsabers. Hera also hears it, right? Like yeah. she's so what she happens, can hear it. Again, you have stolen my next note out from under me because I didn't realize that was going on when I first watched the scene. Got it. I first watched the scene and it was like she listens for a bit and then is like, okay, well, we're gonna act on this. I didn't realize no when Hera is quiet when she sits there and listens and trusts the force she can also hear the lightsabers right which is so cool which is insane to me she's like oh fuck he's right something's fucking happening out there anyway she turns around and she starts barking commands and i'm like yeah that's general (laughs) syndulla yep there she is we do get a mention from hu yang of kanan jaris i was gonna say name drop neat and cool uh, so, I'm sorry. Carson Tiva is the best character to come out of the Mandoverse, hands down. I no literally question. have my next note is about him. No question, because he gets this info dump yep. on Jason. It's just like, okay. He, the fact that he just accepts, like, my favorite thing is Hu Yang is just like, oh, yeah, he was a Jedi or whatever. Carson just goes, oh, a Jedi? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Like, I believe you. Okay. Whatever you say, like, <laughs> sure. I'll do whatever I'm, now. I'm down with this. I'm I'm a little bummed that they they folded Rangers of the New Republic into the main Mandalorian show, mainly because I thought they should have given it to this guy. You know, yeah, every time we keep getting him more and more and more, I'm like, this would have been an actually good show. Like, I don't understand why they didn't have him like lead this show of like theoretically he would be like the captain of the squad and then like that was it you know it gives me the vibes of like a not uh, this is kind of silly but like a chicago pd a chicago fire esque show where like it's about the ensemble cast and it's like they always go out and solve like a crime or they go and solve like whatever it's a dick wolf show in space it would have been so good see my thing and here's why i like star wars publishing so much just generally star wars is kind of a genre in and of itself but it's also a setting and you can do other types of stories within the broad genre of star wars as long as you're following certain markers to make it feel like a star wars story you can't go completely off into left field and do whatever you want but one thing that i think publishing does really interestingly is plays around with genre with the type of story that it's telling within this specific genre so it's not just an action adventure story Right. There are different types of stories. There are there's romance novels. There's thriller novels. There's political novels that are set in the Star Wars. To say nothing of the comics, where the comics end up going. So I kind of wish that every TV show wasn't just an action adventure. I think it'd be really fun to have like the guy, you know, a twelve episode show that's episodic on the guys who are the sitting on the frontier of the new republic trying to keep order and every week they have a different case like that would be crazy to me or like a political soap opera or like not not you and or not whatever you're doing you keep doing whatever you're doing i don't know if i can classify what Andor's doing i just know i like it yeah i fucking love carson tiva this guy's great section three during their fight ahsoka challenges anakin implying he has nothing more to teach her he slices the platform beneath her causing her to fall into a flashback a younger Ahsoka Tano finds herself awakening to a battle where she leads clone troopers. Admits a lull in the battle, Ahsoka stands in an encampment surrounded by injured clones where she reflects on the losses under her command. Anakin explains the necessity of teaching Ahsoka to be a soldier despite the Jedi's peacekeeping upbringing. Remember how we've talked about how everybody in the show is absolutely killing the acting? Hayden Christensen is beating them all by miles. Like, finally giving him the space and the time to, like, actually, like, do something with this character is eons beyond what he had previously been given before. They were like, oh, you liked that taste of Hayden actually getting to play Anakin again in Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah, here's an entire episode of that. So good. It's unbelievable. It makes me so genuinely angry at George Lucas. It makes me mind blowingly furious at George for Attack of the the way he directed Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith because you can tell when you watch those movies 
who was an established actor that just sort of ignored what George was saying and did whatever they wanted. And these people are Ewan McGregor and Ian McDermott. And then you can also tell that there are some people who are just sort of doing what George says. And one of those people is unfortunately Hayden Christensen. He's always been a good actor. If you watch him in other stuff, he has always been a good actor. He has never really gotten to play this role with this degree of character and subtlety. And part of it is the writing is miles better, but also part of it is like, they're giving him so much space to breathe. But you can also clearly tell he's getting direction. He's he's part of a collaborative process this time around, because this is a sort of acting job that you only get when you're working together with the other actors, with Rosario Dawson and the other actor who we have not mentioned yet, but we're about to. Just, God, I love him in this episode so much. It's insane, particularly when we get to the Clone Wars flashback and he's acting opposite the other actress. Because you can also tell Hayden Christensen is a dad. He's also daddy, but he's literally a dad. Right. And you can tell when he interacts with the other actress, like just how much respect they have for each other and some of the swings they're taking in this role. Anyway, suddenly we're in the Clone Wars. <laughs> We're just here. We're just here. We're, we're in the Clone Wars. We're in early Clone Wars, and we can tell because we've got the Phase 1 armor, I'm pretty sure. I made that as a note. Uh, the note is, first live-action appearance of Phase 1 Clone Troopers since Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. It's also the first time Clone Troopers are played by actors in real costumes. In the film, all Troopers were entirely computer-generated. Yes. It is not the first time Clone Troopers in armor have appeared on screen that was obi-wan kenobi with the 501st but it is the first time we're getting the phase one attack of the clones bradley's favorite star wars movie realized with actual actors wearing those outfits and we also we suddenly have a different actress playing ahsoka what now this is we do we did a little different normally we've been doing the actors up top of the section but I went ahead and went through because I knew we were going to hit her very quickly. And that, yeah, she's also the, the only first, new The first anyway. thing you noticed. Yeah. yeah, there's two major people that need to be mentioned that are in this episode. Uh, and one of them we have covered before on the show. But Bradley, you want to tell us who is playing young Ahsoka Tano? Yes, uh, young Ahsoka is being played by Ariana Greenblatt. Uh, you may have seen her recently in the film Barbie. Uh, she was in that. Uh, she was also in uh, Avengers Infinity War playing young Gamora. And then she was in uh, the movie called 65 with Adam Driver, actually. So there's your another Star Wars connection. So she's a new and upcoming actress in the scene. She's amazing. <laughs> uh, we say upcoming actress. She's like 16. She has a Disney trifecta. I love that. Good for her. Technically. On a technicality. She has one on a technicality. I don't think it's a technicality. I'm going to award it to her. It's a music video. She's also in Disney Channel shows, though. So that counts. Which Disney Channel show is she in? She's in two different Disney Channel shows. And then also she actually is in a regular thing produced by Disney, which is called The One and Only Ivan. Okay, so, so not a technicality. A not a technicality. <laughs> uh, Ariana Greenblatt is 16-ish. And already right. has a Disney trifecta, having right. played young Ahsoka Tano in Ahsoka, uh, young Gamora in Avengers Infinity War, and been in a bunch of Disney stuff. So congratulations on your incredible fucking career success this early, which she deserves because she's also beating the ever-loving shit out of this role. And I kind of like, like I said, I after seeing her in this role and seeing also seeing her social media where she talks about being in the role, how much she loves playing Ahsoka. She it, loves Ahsoka. It's so like, yes, we need more of her playing Ahsoka. Like, it's so good. Not to keep bringing up Percy Jackson, but we're getting this interesting thing now where we're getting like continuations or adaptations of things that are really popular. Yeah. And they're getting actors that clearly love the source material. Like these young kid actors that not just love it, but understand it really well. Like you look at Ariana Greenblatt and her, the way she portrays Ahsoka in the Ryloth scene and you go, yeah, you've watched seasons one and two of the Clone Wars probably multiple times. Yeah. You may have watched this show more than I did. Like, <laughs> I think she did. Yeah. To prepare for this role. It's crazy how 
well she captures Ahsoka. And we're also kind of seeing the same thing with uh, Walker Scoble as Percy Jackson. Yeah. Somebody who just like, yeah, you you fundamentally get what this character is about. It's anyway. almost amazing that like casting someone at an appropriate age to play a young character who does minimum, like the I bare minimum of research, you know, about the character is good at playing the character. Like, I don't know. Wow. I wow. Incredible. Incredible. Paired, paired up with, with good writing from people who are trying to tell a good story and are not just trying to make the lowest common denominator product will do. Anyway, we, we can't keep bitching about the Percy Jackson movies. Let's talk about the fucking de-aging in this scene, because if we thought the world between worlds was really good, this is flawless. Like, literally, this is perfect. I mean, it, it was like, it was almost one for one to the animation, like him in the Clone Wars armor, like him uh, in the Clone Wars armor with the Clone Wars hair. Uh, and then but the way that they they the way that the lighting is working in these scenes and the way it's playing on Hayden Christensen's DH features, if you showed me that image in 2009 and you had said this is an image of hayden christensen right now playing clone wars anakin skywalker i would have full ass believed you right it looks like almost like a great photoshop like if someone had done it back in the day been like let's put him in the outfit that he's wearing in the animated show and then they just like cgi his face onto like the cartoon body like i'm like yeah that that looks exactly the same like it looks the same it looks the same he looks like he did <laughs> around 2005 like he genuinely i cannot express this enough i paused and was looking for nitpicks because I knew it was going to come. Could not find a single one. Could not it's, find anything similar. about it that put it off put it off to me. It didn't look too smooth. The way it was in motion was just incredible. Like it's uh, it's so good. So this is definitely taking place on Ryloth. If you're just joining us, the Battle of Ryloth was a very early battle in the Clone Wars. It was sort of the season finale ish of the first season of the Clone Wars. They did have a random episode from like season three that they finished and tacked on to the end of Clone Wars season one for complicated reasons we don't have time to get into. The Battle of Ryloth covered essentially three episodes of the Clone Wars, Storm over Ryloth, Innocence of Ryloth, and Liberty on Ryloth. Each sort of followed a different Jedi. There is actually a secret fourth episode about Ryloth. We don't have time to get into that, but it's, I can't remember if it's earlier in the season or in another season. I think it might've been season three. The main ones we're concerned with are the three at the end of the first season. Uh, and Storm over Ryloth is the one we're really concerned with because that's the one that centers around Anakin and Ahsoka. And it centers around, notably, Ahsoka losing a bunch of her troops after making some bad calls. But pause, pause, because we need to talk about the fact that she's a fucking child. They did such a good job with making you go, oh yeah, she's only like 14 and she's a general in the army she's a commander but yes commander but yeah you know what i mean Th like are you serious that is a whole ass child right she should be like having gossip by the lockers with her friends she should be carrying around ridiculously frilly pens to take notes in in class like she should be worrying about the seventh grade dance not fucking the lives of men on the battlefield. Jedi Order. Jedi Order. Come here. What the fuck? What the actual fuck? It is one thing to be told in the animated show that she is a 14-year-old girl. It is another thing to see this fucking child having to fight in this battle. And also, Anakin's also like 20. He should be at the club. Why is he here? He should yeah. be in therapy. Not what that is makes he any doing sense. here? Why are you sending this man who is barely out of his teens and whose brain has not finished crystallizing yet and this fucking middle schooler out here to lead this battle? Are you people fucking insane? Are you? What the fuck is wrong with you, Yoda? What what is wrong with you? I guess you know, like nine hundred years really takes its toll on you. Like you know, after a while, <laughs> your mental capacity. Thanks. I saw you on the Star Hopper in the the High Republic. You know this is bad. <laughs> you know what you're doing is wrong. You little fucking frog. The fuck is wrong with you? Christ, Yoda, meet me in the Denny's parking lot. I am just gonna beat the shit out of you. <laughs> I'm not even gonna be subtle about that. Fucking hell. <sighs> 
I have a lot of feelings about Ahsoka in this episode. <laughs> yeah, I see. We do see some Twi'leks in the background, which is so, a cool background detail. Gotcha. So really, really strongly dating us to Ryloth. I was going to say, I guess that's the confirmation, right? Like that's sort of the confirmation that right. that's, that's where we are. Got it. But though I do think they say the Battle of Ryloth somewhere in the episode. Uh, okay. Wikipedia, shout out Wikipedia, hey, they they do note in their recap of the episode that it's it's definitely the Battle of Ryloth. Uh, no, actually, let me take that back. Uh, I went back and reread it. Uh, apparently, the scene with the Twi'lex takes place at the Battle of Ryloth. Wikipedia seems to think that the battle that is happening while they're running around is the Battle of Teth, which was one of their was their actual first mission together or their second mission together. I don't. I'm not sure. I agree with that. I don't know if it was explicitly stated in the episode that it was Battle of Teth, but I don't have time to go back and check now. Anyway. Let's talk about somebody in the background of this shot, Bradley. So Ahsoka's having her little conversation, her little moment with her clone trooper that's wrapped up and like on the stretcher who like reaches over and like touches her hand. Uh, but I'm distracted from this beautiful moment by the presence of one Captain Rex in the background. Did you notice Captain Rex? I don't have him till the Siege of Mandalore, so. Oh no, he's here. He's in the background. He's having a com- He's the one having a conversation with Anakin and like two other people. Oh. And Anakin tells him like, you keep talking to them and he goes over. He doesn't have any lines. Okay, because I was but like. But he's here. Live action Rex is here. Does he have the pauldron on? I don't remember that being a big deal. I don't remember. I just know you can visually identify him as Rex. Or is he just a clone with blue? No, he's definitely mark. Rex. Pull, pull the episode up. I'm pulling I'll wait. it up. I'm pull it up. up. Okay. I'll wait. Pull it up. I just got to double check. You can definitely see Anakin talking to Rex and two other All people right. in the background. We'll get there. We'll get there. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, man. That's like a blink and you miss it kind of thing. Super it's blink and you miss it. So blink and you miss it because it, he's like, it's so shrouded in like fog and mist or whatever this like flashback you know, dust is supposed to be. And then you're right. It's very like subtle, but you have to really be paying attention to see it. But yeah, that's definitely him. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. That was the only Rex we thought we were getting in this episode, but put a pin in that. We'll come back to that later. Okay. Uh, So Anakin and Ahsoka have a conversation and the early conversation is a lot like the one that they have in uh, their episode of the Ryloth arc, which is Storm over Ryloth. It's very similar to that. It's very similar to that conversation. I think there's some interesting things happening as this conversation progresses. Namely, looking at Ahsoka as a character as she is established in the opening episodes of this show, Ahsoka is somebody who has lost a lot of faith, and particularly a lot of faith in herself. That she was the one that walked away from Sabine's training because she didn't believe that she was going to be able to train her. She's the one who refuses to train Grogu. She's somebody who doubts herself because of what she has learned. Because of she learned on Malachor that, hey, Anakin turned into Vader. She's like, oh, well, damn, if Anakin can turn into Vader, I can turn into Vader. So she's hesitant. She's not doing things. She spent so much time blaming herself that she's refusing to just trust herself trust the force trust things around her she has trust issues as a result of all of what has happened to her and she's also concerned she brings up to anakin like he he brings up like hey i was training you to be a soldier she's like why right why what what was good about that because what am i going to pass on to my now that you've just taught me how to be a soldier what am i going to do pass on to my apprentice just how to be a soldier Is that the legacy now? Is the legacy violence? Like, she's concerned about perpetrating this essentially legacy of violence that Balin Skull seems to think that she has. Which is very interesting that the lesson Anakin is teaching her, at least what he is saying with his mouth to her, is almost wrong. When he's talking about, you know, training her to be a soldier, her reaction is more about exposing what her real issue is, as opposed to just... As opposed to just Anakin explains to her, like, where she went wrong. It's much more interesting and much more subtle than it appears on the surface. I also find it interesting that I I think I have a note here that she's always kind of somewhat wanted to give up fighting, I think, due to that early war experience. That that, the Clone Wars really traumatized her in ways that doesn't really get addressed, but is getting addressed here. So... I also think that she carries a lot of that trauma with her and has never really confronted it in any meaningful way. Because again, I don't think she trusts herself to have the right answer. 
what I want to compare it to is like it, it gives the vibes of like Iscat Akaris from Rise of the Red Blade because in the book she has a very similar you know situation other than I mean yeah, you can kind of compare it in the sense that it was around the Clone Wars it was the same thing and her now Iscat's you know master died uh you know Ahsoka technically her master died so it's like it's like if you're going to be technical about it um they have a very similar thing you know except the difference was Iscat was traumatized and she did become an inquisitor and the thing is Ahsoka could have easily become an inquisitor like oh, if 100% if she had just gotten if if Palpatine had gotten to her at the right time I feel like he could have turned her the only difference is that because she left and she felt so abandoned by everybody like if he had gotten her from that trauma and from that just abandonment like she she would have easily become an inquisitor and it's just amazing how she because she was on her own and she was a little more self-reliant she was kind of like i guess the anti-inquisitor in that sense because she was trying to kill them but yeah she overcorrected kind of she she overcorrected she went too much in the opposite direction she didn't go quite as far as like luke skywalker does in last jedi or um obi-wan does in the obi-wan show of like cutting herself off from the force like she never really does that but she does overcorrect slightly um and that's you know we see that in the ahsoka novel and in other places as well but it's it's interesting the way that she's having to learn this lesson about trusting in herself and trusting in the force we'll we'll get to the other scene later we we cannot keep talking about just this one scene we have to end on the shot of darth vader walking away so boom i was correct we did get a physical appearance from darth vader it counts that was physical he physically shows vader physically shows put a pin put a pin in that technically this counts there will be a uh, two separate moments later on where vader turns up physically in a more direct way but we'll get to it again physically we get to it we we will get to it is it physical it is physical v- darth vader is physically standing there We'll get to it. Well, no, because his body is not real. So we'll therefore... get we'll get to <laughs> it when we get to it. We desperately need to move on to the next scene. Section four. While Jason and Chopper remain at the Henge, Hera and the X-Wing squad persist in their search. Despite concerns about fuel, Sindula extends the sweep. Hera questions the mission's legitimacy, but Hu Yang assures her, and Jason alerts the, to the ghost to something on Chopper's scanners, prompting a low-flight search over the water. I only have two notes for this sequence. One is serious, one is funny. The serious note is, I love the scene between Hu Yang and Hera, because Hera... They have this conversation, and then Hera kind of looks over at Hu Yang and is like, hmm, you know, sometimes I also need advice. And it's a very mature moment of her. And it's something that's nice for her to demonstrate, that even though she's usually the mom figure, sometimes she also needs to listen to someone else. So I thought that that. was cool. Yeah. Uh, My funny note is her eye roll when Chopper says, get low, and she rolls her eyes because she's, she's like, I know what Chopper wants. How low? Yeah, like, literally give me a measurement. Like... How low. <laughs> but I also know that Chopper has probably made get low jokes before. And she's like, oh my god, is this one of those? Is Chopper being funny? I Bizarrely, the relationship between Hera and Chopper translates so well into this show. I love their little, uh, just conversations with each other. It's just so great. Because <laughs> they've been together Hera's basically entire life at this point. She was yeah. Jason's age when she met Chopper. That's so true. And we don't really know how old she is technically. I mean, I think she's in her. I want to say 30s or 40s. I want to say she's in her early 40s. Yeah, at least by this point, she's at least by this point. I want to say she's in her early to mid 40s. Yeah, because when maybe when we saw her in Bad Batch, she She was like couldn't have been like 10 or 11. No, she would have probably been closer to to 13 or 14 in Bad Batch. I'm thinking in Bad Batch was roughly 25 years ago so yeah she's she's in her 40s and she's yeah. been with chopper since she was a child i like it section five ahsoka continues her flashback journey this time she relives the siege of mandalore an encounter with anakin reveals his pride in her but tano sees her legacy as one of death and war when his sith persona emerges they begin to duel he kicks her out of the flashback and into the world between worlds ahsoka choosing to live disarms anakin who acknowledges hope for her the world begins to fade, and Ahsoka is enveloped in water. She is pulled from the waters by Lieutenant Jensu and pulled aboard the ghost. So I'm going to give you a little word of warning, Bradley. Okay. 
on my phone screen, my notes for this section are filling up the almost the entire screen. All right, get into it. I'll just sit back and you just <laughs> let's go. go. For it. Let's go. Oh, yep. So we get on screen Maul DeLoreans. Uh, yeah, I was like, whoa, that guy's cool. Yep, that's an on screen Maul DeLorean, which is rad. I was like, that looks sick. I like that shit. That is sick. And we get Ahsoka fighting them, which is cool. And then we get our major Rex cameo because someone is voicing Rex. You want to tell just, us who's voicing Captain just, Rex? Just a, just a random dude. No one in particular. No one important. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. It is Tamora Morrison. It is fucking Tamora Morrison is in the show as the voice of Captain Rex. Which is the first time Tamora Morrison has voiced Captain Rex in live action. It's also the first time he's voiced Captain Rex ever. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because Captain Rex is normally voiced by Dee Bradley Baker. Right. Yeah. So I guess this is the this should technically just be the first time it's not voiced by Dee Bradley Baker. Yes. I guess is a better way this is it. the first time Captain Rex has not been voiced by Dee Bradley Baker. Wow. It is being voiced by Tamara Morrison, the voice of the original clones in the movies, and also everything prior to the Clone Wars TV show. So last section, we talked about Ahsoka having trust issues, and I sort of intimated that she's worried about inheriting Anakin's darkness, that because of the experience on Malachorn, it's learning that Anakin became Vader. She's now concerned that he will, those same teachings he passed to her will make her susceptible to the dark side. Here's the scene where we get the explicit confirmation of that, which is why she's holding back so much, or part of why she's holding back so much, why she doesn't trust herself, why she doesn't trust the Force, and to a degree why she doesn't trust Anakin. Just shout out to the two actors in this scene for being fucking good at this. I'm telling you, they have such good chemistry. They have such good chemistry. Like, I remember when I was in, this was before I, I went to the campus we were on together. The one previously, the major I was doing, you had to take some acting classes and you had to take some like history of theater classes and things because technically we were a all writing, any script writing across the board major. Now I say technically because I have some complaints about this but we don't have time to get into that. One of the courses we had to take, there was an exercise we did. We were supposed to bring in a scene of just two actors talking, and it was supposed to showcase good acting just through two actors having a conversation. I brought in the scene from Game of Thrones season one where Robert Baratheon and Cersei Lannister are having wine together and talking about their failing marriage, because it is genuinely the best scene in season one of Game of Thrones. But okay. also, it's just Lena Headey and Mark Addy just acting the fuck out of these roles. This scene would also qualify, either this one or the one before, of just Ariana Greenblatt and Hayden Christensen having a conversation. Yeah. So there's so much subtlety because Ariana is playing adult Ahsoka, having a conversation through the body of teenage Ahsoka. It's crazy. Yes. How it's do they absolutely do? I, yeah, crazy. I don't know how she did that, but it was great. Anakin turns around and he's got the yellow eyes now. And this is the point where Darth Vader has now shown up. This is Darth Vader. She has been getting a lesson not from Anakin Skywalker, but from Darth Vader. Ah. Like, that's the twist. It was Vader the whole time. Or maybe it was, mo it was moving towards Vader. It started as Anakin. It was moving towards Vader. There came a point where where the shift started happening and then boom, suddenly it's revealed it's Vader that's there, which is just an awesome moment where he ignites the saber and it's red. Yes. That and you're like, cool. oh, this was Darth Vader, but also not, it's complicated. I think based on some videos I've seen that at least part of this fight scene might have actually been Ariana and Hayden. Yeah, uh, there's video of them training together. There's video so, of them training yeah. together. So I, I think I some it. or part of this might have actually been them. And I know Hayden did a bunch of his own stunt work for this because the man is in unbelievable physical shape. I love it. And he's he's got a natural talent for this. Like people who have talked about Hayden on set, like the way he fights, have just been like, yeah, he's fucking incredible. Like he's so quick. So that she she kept up with him, which is awesome. But yeah, I think this might actually be them. He like blasts her back in and we get the shot that has cropped up everywhere of Anakin walking out. And then yes, this is the other point where Darth Vader physically shows up and walks towards her for like just a moment. But he's there. I'm going to I'm going to keep pushing back on you on this. He's not physically there. It's a force ghost. So it's there's a no, force, phys there's it's no a force physical ghost. anything. It's a force ghost. It's but metaphysical. It's beating the hell out of Ahsoka Tano. 
I mean, whatever it is, it's physical. whatever it is, it's physical enough that that lightsaber is not going to pass through her. True. No, I do like that. But then again, it's also in the sense that, like, does she think that that's what's going to happen? So she's making it real. Look, versus... I observed. I observed <laughs> Darth Vader on screen with my eyeballs. That counts. Okay, I, I'm with you. They fight. There is a moment where there's a moment where, like, the lighting on Ahsoka's face kind of makes her look a little bit closer to the dark side. I liked that. Which is a great little moment. And yeah. then, just like Luke, remember we talked about Luke, the callback to Luke in the opening scene? So she disarms him, she has him at her mercy, and just like Luke, she throws the lightsaber away. It's an echo of that same moment. The lesson that Luke taught Anakin, he has now passed down to Ahsoka. I like that. This scene... So there's a lot going on in this scene, and I'm just going to talk about my impression of what I think this scene with Anakin means. So bear with me. I think that what's going on here is not so much that Ahsoka chooses to, like, live rather than survive. I think it's more complicated than that. I think that the question is she spent so much time fixated on her failure with Anakin. She chooses to live, but not at the cost of Anakin. Like, it would have been easy for her to say, I'm going to completely excise Anakin Skywalker, I'm going to write him off as having been lost as Vader, and I'm going to move forward. She chooses not to do that. She chooses to carry Anakin Skywalker forward with her. The good parts of Anakin Skywalker. The parts of Anakin Skywalker that were a good master and a good friend to her. I have in my notes, I'm just going to read out loud what I wrote in my notes. She learned the conviction he taught her, the good lessons, and chooses to take them forward. And it's not just about survival or even about quote-unquote living. It's about coming to her own role in this Master to Padawan legacy. That's my takeaway of this scene. I don't know if you have anything for this scene, Bradley, or if you're just going to let me wax philosophical. I mean, I don't have anything other than just like the lesson has been learned. You know, the she, lesson has you been know, learned. she she learned her lesson, and in that, you're right. It's not she was holding on to. It wasn't that she like had to choose to live or die. Like he wasn't gonna kill her. Like I think it was like, are you going to let that part of you die that like you've been holding on to, and you're gonna move forward? Or are you going to hold on to your like fear and your like loss that you have that you think that you fucked up somehow and it's all your fault and everything's all on you or whatever i don't think yeah i don't think that's the situation i think she's she's let go of the past essentially and she's moved on to a new ahsoka yeah she's she's let go of it but she's also carried some of it through with her and i think it's important that you know remember we got that twist that it was vader right that Anakin was Vader, we get kind of the untwist at the end of this when she chooses to live and he turns back into Anakin because Anakin was always there. He was there all along. She saw Vader because that she was fixated more on that failure, what she perceived to be that failure. But Anakin was always there and Anakin was always teaching her. And when he looks at her and says, there's hope for you yet, that's the closest that Anakin Skywalker can come to saying, I'm proud of you. You've got this and then disappears. This seems crazy. How is any of this working? We don't know who gives a fuck. <laughs> it's a metaphor. Just fucking go with it. She starts filling like she starts filling up with water. I think it's notable that she never struggles as the water's right. filling up. She's she she is finally, she is finally trusting in herself and trusting in the force. Whatever's happening, Ahsoka's just going to go with it. My next note is when they're pulling her out. My note is like a fucking painting. The show remains visually gorgeous. So good. Unfortunately, I have to end this section with my final note of being slightly negative, so bear with me. I know okay. I just lavished praise on the first 25 minutes of the episode. This. This is the point where the episode should have ended. Her being pulled from the water. Her being pulled from the water. I agree. Boom. Episode ended. Yeah, she's rescued. She's Everything rescued. is tied the up in an arc, ice bow. Ahsoka's yeah. arc has been completed. She started the episode in one place. She ended the episode in another place. And I will say, when I was making my notes for this, when I was breaking it up into sections, I felt like these last two sections were extraneous. It wasn't something we needed. Like, I had it's to something we needed go out of my the, way to make these. <laughs> it's something we needed for the plot. Sure. It is not something we needed for the story of the first 
right. 25 minutes. That is not to say it wasn't necessary. That is not to say it didn't advance Ahsoka. That is not to say there isn't character stuff that happens. The specific story that is told of the relationship between Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano, the thesis statement, the point of that relationship, the thing at the end of it to get the last lesson and finally cement who Ahsoka is as a person, I feel is undercut by having 20 more minutes of something that has very little to do with that. It undermines within the context of that episode that story. And that's part of why I'm like, this episode should have been 16, 22 minute episodes, possibly. Or it should have been structured, there should have been different structural changes that were made to how scenes are arranged and how scenes are put together in order. This whole idea of chopping it up, just taking the one complete story and chopping it up into episodes, this is where that fails because for me, it undercuts that moment. And when I watch this episode, I will be perfectly flat honest with the audience. I came away disappointed. I walked away from the episode, like I was riding that high for the first 25 minutes, 30 minutes. I came away from the episode disappointed. I was like, why did I have to keep going? Why couldn't I just sit there with what just happened? Why couldn't I take some time to process the major character moment that is the central pivotal turning point of this entire show and the thesis statement on a character that Dave Filoni has been working with for 20 years? Why can't I live in that moment? So that's, that's my biggest critique of this episode. That's the biggest negative thing I have to say about this, is that this is really, for me, the biggest point where the structure gets in the way of me being able to enjoy this moment and enjoy this episode. Section 6. Ahsoka awakens on her ship, learning of Jason's efforts to help rescue her. Ahsoka finds the broken map. Using the Force, she discovers Ren is alive, but willingly joined Morgan aboard the Eye of Scion. Carson notifies Hera that the New Republic fleet is en route to Cetos, and in a call with Mon Mothma aboard the Ghost, Mothma informs them of the Senate Oversights Committee's order for her to return to Coruscant for a hearing. Ahsoka joins them for a solution to find Sabine. We get uh, what is affectionately referred to as bald Ahsoka. Uh, Ahsoka I wrote down I wrote down naked Ahsoka, but yeah, sure. It's, it's like bald Ahsoka, why, naked Ahsoka. I'm like, why is her headdress not on? <laughs> like, put it Pause. On. I do want to note it's actually very the makeup job is actually very impressive. Oh, it's so good. Like that I was like genuinely shocked. Like I was like, that's a part of her head. Like yeah. I was like, this is the first time I've been like, that's not a headpiece. Like that's her body. No, like, that's her actual body. Like <laughs> yes. that's what she looks like. So shout out to the makeup department because I was yeah, no. genuinely like, whoa. A lot of people are like, haha, she's without her headpiece. And I'm like, are right. y'all missing the point that this is a fucking flawless transition the job? Blend. The, the blend. The blend here. This is this is one of those moments that we get into we are a gay people podcast. <laughs> because the fucking blend here. Oh my god. She is she is winning RuPaul's drag race. She I is just coming in and sweeping for this because my god, she looks incredible. Uh, I love that Jason's just kind of playing with Chopper. Like His Chopper's name. like the family cat. He is the family cat. Yeah. <laughs> and not someone who killed tens of thousands of fascists never during the last war. <laughs> They're just playing He's just, he's just a fun little guy. I like how he's just running in circles, too. And Chopper's like, oh, we got to course correct. Oh, like, got to course correct. Oh. The, thing <laughs> is, the thing is, it's interesting. Chopper's also having fun. Chopper very clearly loves Jason. Like, Chopper would play pranks on, like, Ezra and the others aboard the Ghost. Uh, but he, he likes them. He had affection for them. He didn't really care this much. He fucking loves Jason. Yeah, he's like weird. indulging this shit. He's like playing with this kid. He's entertaining this kid. He's really taking his role as a babysitter for this kid seriously. As like, no, this this droid is helping to raise this child. I also love the scene between Jason and Ahsoka, who clearly know each other. Jason, actually, just Jason in this episode is a standout. Um, yeah, he, really he would got have his been, time to shine. He would have been the standout of the episode if it had not been for Hayden and, and Ariana. And I, I was kind of disappointed, too, because this is really kind of the last time we see him. It's not this, like... For know, now. For now, right. For now. But for now, this is the last time we will see him. Yeah, he's kind of like... I guess they knew this was either the last time we were going to see him or... I mean, he may or may not show up for a second in like the end. But uh, this is the first time he has... Or last time he has dialogue of any kind, for sure. And yeah, it's just interesting because it's almost like the whole point of this episode, like 
this is where they're, they're about to split off from the right. group. And I was disappointed because I felt like, I mean, you know, it's dangerous, but like, just fucking bring the kid along. Who cares? <laughs> bring the kid to Peridia. It's fine. Right. Who cares? Well, I also think it's notable just to the degree of how much Hera is trying to keep Jason out of the action, right? I think that's interesting to look at compared to, you know, Ezra and Sabine and sort of the necessity of them being involved. Even though they were older teenagers, Ezra was like 15 at the start of of Rebels, even though they were a little older than Jason. Hera's taking great pains, and I wonder if that has something to do with losing Ezra. I feel like, yeah, she's probably a little losing overprotective. And losing, yeah, losing Kanan yeah. and losing Ezra. So she wants to keep this kid with her, but she's constantly like, you need to stay stay back out of the danger. Right. Uh, I also love Jason's conversation with Hu Yang. I think if you're going to send Jason off for season one, that's the note to do it on. Because it's such a funny, such a funny, uh, will you train me? No. No, absolutely not. <laughs> And it's like, wait, why? If you think about it, if anything, Hu Yang should be a proponent for training Jason because he's actually young enough and he's Hu showing Yang, signs Hu of Yang the force. Is still, Hu Yang is still 75% original parts. How many of those original parts do you think he'd be if he tried to suggest to Harris and Dula that they should train Jason as a Jedi? I don't know. But not 75 <laughs> percent but if you but in, in like a logic aspect he should be like a very big pusher of training jason because he's like whoa he's showing affinity for the force his father was kanan jarrus like you he already knows this information so he's like and his aunt is ahsoka like like ahsoka you should be training jason why are you not I, training him right now like i think hu yang understands to an extent that Jason has a bit of a different path to walk, and that path is going to be not with the Jedi. That Jason's abilities and things, Jason is not meant to walk this path. He is Kanan and Hera's son. He was not going to be a traditional Jedi in the same mold as Sabine or the same mold as Ezra. That's not a thing that's going to be open to him as a viable option. We'll see. We'll see where Jason goes as a character because I never expected him to come back and continue to have content. I expect him to just be a one-off at the end of Rebels, but no, he's he's still here. I keep thinking like what they're going to do is like every time we see him, he'll get like slightly older each time. So it's going to be like right now we're getting child Jason. So the next one has to be teenage Jason. And then the following is going to be adult, young adult Jason. And then it's going to be like old man Jason. Like they're going to keep doing like iterations of him like randomly. Well, Jason's around the same age. Jason is around the same age as Kylo Ren. So he's in his 30s. He's probably in his early 30s during the sequel trilogy. Oh my god, what if they do like a storyline where they go to the training academy together and then Kylo ends up killing Jason? <laughs> well, he's too old to go to Luke's training. Oh too no, old. he's not. No, no he's, he's not. not. No, he's not. Her- Hera fucking Hera fucking won't let him. No, of course not. There's no way in hell. There's no way in hell. Uh yes, Ahsoka is using psychometry in the scene. It is cool. We've talked about psychometry before. We move on. Uh I love Chopper's little uh oh. He gets this little moment. I also like the visual design of Ahsoka as she transitions from Ahsoka the Grey to Ahsoka the White. Uh, Because she gradually adds white pieces as the episode progresses. Do you notice that? She's wearing like a white cloak originally like in the scene in the hinge. And then by the time she's in the cockpit, she's wearing fully white. Right. Anyway, that's very cool. And I like that it's a transition. I am once again defending Mon Mothma on the internet. I am once again here to defend Mon Mothma on the internet because Mon shows up. So Mon basically calls them and is like, you're being dragged before the oversight committee. Do you have any fucking evidence of your claims? Right. Right. Literally just anything. Literally anything. Anything at all. Because Mon clearly, I have a sneaking suspicion that they did not, the oversight committee did not intend to warn Hera that she was going to be court-martialed. I have a sneaking suspicion that Mon is calling Hera directly to be like, hey, FYI, you're going to be court-martialed. You need to prep for this. Right. Do you have any evidence? You need evidence. From CTOS. No? Okay. You need Ahsoka. You need to bring Ahsoka back with you because Ahsoka is going to need to testify. Because if she testifies, she can back up what you're claiming. Because remember, 
Ahsoka has more substantial evidence that Thrawn is out there because Ahsoka actually spoke to Morgan Elspeth. You remember yes. Morgan Elspeth? She's also in this show. Oh yeah, that's right. There's a character in this show named Morgan, right? Um... Yes, there are other characters in this show, but none of them are in this episode. They're all in the next episode. Also, if you think about it, it would solve all of her problems because like, okay, let's say Ahsoka goes before the committee and she testifies. She, they know Morgan escaped because they know that that has to be in their records that a prisoner escaped from a New Republic ship, that that all that happened. Like that's, that's public knowledge. That has to be. So, or at least it's knowledge to the New Republic. It's, you know, someone knows about it. She can be like, yeah, it was Morgan Elspeth. I saw her. We've interacted. I saw the people who broke her out. Like she can receipts, proof, timeline, screenshots, fucking everything. <laughs> exactly. She has it all. Okay. So she can testify and be like, yo, this is what's happening right now. Morgan told me. She could just say this. Morgan told and me she's I'm got, getting Thrawn And she's back. got who knows how much other evidence that she's uncovered to lead her to Morgan in the first place. Right. And so, but obviously this is a no-brainer choice. They're not going to do that. They're going to send, who is now fully Ahsoka the White when she gets into the cockpit. They are now fully going to send Ahsoka to Peridia to go try to stop what's happening and get Sabine back. Obvious no-brainer choice. They don't even debate this. But yeah, Mon, Mon Mothma is doing the best she can in this scene to warn Hera ahead of time and make sure that she's prepared without being impartial or while still being as impartial as possible to this proceeding and not interfering in it. Section 7. And finally, with a new plan in motion, Ahsoka's ship, the Ghost, and Tiva squad ascend into the Sea Toast sky. The New Republic fleet arrives, and Tiva stalls them. Tano communicates with the Purgle through the Force. As the creature opens its mouth, she orders Hu Yang to move the ship inside, and the Purgle, emerging from Sea Toast, prepares to jump into hyperspace. Tano and the Purgle enter hyperspace, leaving Sea Toast behind. We have an Ishi Tib, New Republic officer, which is cool. I like <laughs> seeing weird aliens. They're going to just introduce a new alien officer pilot whatever every single episode they're just like yeah let's just and i'm here for it i'm here for it i'm here for it doing it he's so funny looking too i love it speaking of funny though we have to we have to talk we have to talk about carson (laughs) tevin we have to talk about i respectfully disagree (laughs) right he is so funny like in the sense that she he's like this is a covert mission she's like what do you mean there's no covert mission he's like yeah there is i promise like he's like that's what i was told and she's like no there isn't because his whole thing is his whole thing is he needs to stall right his whole thing is he needs to stall you know what it's giving it's giving poe dameron in the last jedi i was just about to say that he's like the school of poe dameron he he taught poe this tactic he taught poe this tactic (laughs) of just like i know you are but what am i like kind of situation like uh wait a minute hi i'm holding for general hogs yes oh god i could i could (laughs) the fact the fact that ryan johnson opened that movie with i can hear you can you hear me (laughs) so stupid it's fucking amazing i love it and carson's doing the same thing here and then then this man is like okay so new stall tactic i'm just gonna tell you the whole situation He's like, he's just like, okay, let me start for so the beginning. Let me start for the beginning. And he a long time ago in a galaxy story. far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> he's, and he I starts with him. war. Uh, just kidding. Uh, uh, imagine if he had sat there and just like, well. He's like, okay, we're going to start from the beginning. <laughs> Star Wars episode one, the Phantom Menace. Right. Yeah. He's he a time of crawl. turmoil. <laughs> right. I don't remember the opening crawl to Phantom Menace off the top of my head. Trade negotiations have broken down with yeah, the Trade Federation, and the Federation has blockaded the planet of Naboo. <laughs> I can't. That would have been so funny. Uh, we weren't originally planning to talk about who's playing Captain Gerard. Yes. Is the name of the character. But I do want to shout out Captain Gerard anyway, because she does a fantastic job. Isa Davis is who's playing Captain Gerard in this scene. She was also recently in Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, Mayor of Easttown, and House of Cards. So, shout out to her. Ahsoka is good with animals. We can guess this is probably because she trained with Obi-Wan, who is canonically good with animals. Also note that we are not really going to get the explanation until I think next episode, but the fact that they're they're trying to get the whales to she's they're trying to essentially tap into the same thing that ezra did where just get the whales to return to factory settings return to default that is a clue as to what is actually going on and how they managed to pull this off and i believe next episode we're going to find out 
how this plan worked. So stick with me. I know a lot of people are like, how did they know the whales were going to take them to the same point? We will get there. Yeah, I think Huyang actually we'll says, how this he goes, how do you know that they're going to take us to Perdia or whatever? And, he, and she's like, I don't know. <laughs> she's like, I have no idea. Yeah, well, have no idea. that's that's the only thing that sort of makes this back section work for me is that Ahsoka affirms that she's no, no, she's no longer doing a, I go where I needed. She's no longer doing a drifting along. She's trusting in the force. She has her plan which is to use the whales to take them to where Ezra went. And it's to a degree she's trusting in herself to be correct, but she's also trusting in the force to guide them where they, they, it wants them to go. It's no longer about Ahsoka. It's no longer where I need to go. It's where the force wills me to go. Ahsoka being swallowed by the whale is probably a reference to the biblical story of Jonah. I I got that as well. It's very much like a... You, you and I both have a great deal of religious trauma that we probably need to unpack at some point. You know what? Just to be just to be a rebel. Um, Actually, this is a reference to the movie Pinocchio, where they get swallowed by a whale. Which, that movie was a reference to the reference biblical to story of Jonah. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, Jonah, quite famously swallowed by a whale. That's not really the point of the story of Jonah. It's the no. stuff that happens after the whale. But this is probably a reference to Jonah being swallowed by the whale. Sure. My final note is I fucking love this scene between Ahsoka and Hera, where it's may the force be with you. This is this may be the last time they ever see each other. Ahsoka is about to do something incredibly insane. Hera is about to go be court-martialed by the New Republic. And they have this moment between these two women who have known each other for so many years. Again, it's giving the Holdo and Leia scene from Last Jedi. Yeah, because, I mean, not to spoil the show at all, like, as far as we know, this is the last time that they are going to see each other. So, you know, because we don't know what happens in season two, um, because it hasn't happened yet. I mean, even Hera, the way she talks to Ahsoka is in this way, like, I'm never going to see you again, theoretically. Also, go get Ezra, like, go get him. Like, you know, as long as you do that, then are you find him or whatever? At least he'll have somebody with him. Like, God, these two actresses, Rosario Dawson and Mary Elizabeth Winston are so fucking good. It's insane how good they are and how much depth that these two women put into the relationship between Ahsoka and Hera that's never explicitly spelled out on screen. We ne they ne Nobody turns to the audience at any point to say Ahsoka and Hera know each other. They have been friends since Ahsoka Episode returned <laughs> from Malachor. Yeah. Um, right. They clearly hold each other in very high regard. All of that is communicated purely by the actresses and how they interact with each other, and also what the story has the characters do. It's so good. End of episode. Bradley, you want to tell us who directed and wrote this episode? Written and directed by Dave. Oh my. Yeah, no, Dave. Dave Filoni's all over this one. Yeah. Uh, if you if you weren't sure, <laughs> if you weren't sure which episode Dave Filoni was like, yeah, I'll be taking right. that one now. Yeah, so it was pretty good. And look, I, I'm going to be honest here. I bag on Dave Filoni and John Favreau a lot for not collaborating to the degree that I think they should collaborate in the writer's room with other writers. I have said multiple times that I think The Mandalorian and that, that Ahsoka and even and Book of Boba Fett as well need writer's rooms. I think they need other people in the room. I think it's a collaborative process. That being said, there is something to watching a piece of media that is an arterial vision, that authorial vision or something. I forget how to pronounce the actual word, but you know what I mean. It's it's an auteur looking at a thing and going, I'm just going to craft this completely myself. And for good, for ill, for positive, for negative, it's the story they wanted to tell. The Last Jedi, my favorite Star Wars movie, is this. It is Ryan Johnson telling the story that Ryan Johnson wants to tell the way that Ryan Johnson wants to tell it. And you can have your opinions for Ryan Johnson. You can have your critiques of Ryan Johnson. I certainly have both, but that is the, that is Ryan Johnson's movie. That is the movie he wanted to make saying a thing about Star Wars. This episode is the last Jedi of Star Wars TV shows. It is Dave Filoni for 50 minutes saying what Dave Filoni wants to say the way Dave Filoni wants to say it. And any, I have criticisms of it, certainly, but it is a thing to look at and say, this man wrote a love letter to these characters that he spent so much time with. And I think at the end of the day, this is crossing deeply into my final thought. I think at the end of the day, that's good. That's a, a good thing to exist. Sometimes we need that. And this episode 
maybe the most clear point in the Ahsoka show where n- no, it's it's just Dave Filoni, Dave Filoni on screen. I'm cool with that because he he clearly he wanted to tell the story. He said he's had some of these shots in his head for years. So I I guess we'll cross into the final thought then because I just hijacked that whole section. Yeah, I really like this episode. This episode good. Major structural problems, but this episode very good. What about you, Bradley? What's your final thought? I have it pretty much the same. Yeah, I I liked it. I think it should have ended a little sooner and we should have done the Purgle stuff and whatever. The next up beginning of the next episode. That would have made way more sense. But I, overall though, like I think this episode gave me the thought of like, wow, you can really take the Clone Wars stuff and do it live action and do it justice if you care enough. Like if it's not a cash grab, it's not a whatever, like you're just doing it for the sake of doing it. If you're doing it with care and love like Dave Filoni does, we could get that and we would be very happy with it. I think it would be very good of them to do if they if they ever needed to do something like that. And I think Hayden Christensen, Ariana Greenblatt are right there. Just fucking give it to us. So that's my final thought. All right. Well, we will be back next week with more Ahsoka. I think we have locked into a schedule for what we're going to do next. But yeah, we're not. I, I mean, I, we always say tentatively. We always um, say even tentatively. <laughs> we're pretty confident. We're, we've got three episodes left of Ahsoka and then the finale, which we will, we always do. We always do our little recap. Tentatively, we are not planning to jump in the Bad Batch immediately. For various reasons, scheduling behind the scenes, and also because we kind of need a break from current content, and also we want to just fucking finish it because we're tired of it hanging on our schedule. Uh, I think we are going to go back and finish uh, Vision Season 1 before we hop into The Bad Batch. Uh, We will be watching The Bad Batch, obviously, but I don't think we're going to start covering it until we finished with Season 1 of Visions. So I think that is the tentative plan right now. No idea when we'll get to season two of Visions. That will depend largely on when the Acolyte comes out and whether or not we need to go straight from Bad Batch to the Acolyte or how we want to play that. But keep with us. It's definitely a journey. But that is our tentative plan right now. Pluggables. You can find a bunch of shows that Bradley has worked on on Peacock and Bravo. He's worked on so many, we only really plug one at a time. Uh, So currently we are plugging Married to Medicine Season 10, which based on my Twitter is absolutely fucking insane. I can't comment because uh, I'm too close to the project, so (laughs) yes. I love that for you. Without spoiling it, it's a good season this year. (laughs) You can also find me on the Star Wars High Republic TTRPG podcast, as we mentioned earlier in this episode. Maybe if Bradley didn't cut that section out. Maybe. Which is entirely possible because it was a digression. That is For Light and Dice, a Star Wars 5e TTRPG podcast set in the High Republic era. And that is DM'd by Chris from Dark Side Divas, and cast members include myself, Hope from J Guys and Jedi and Collider, Jess from Rupalp's Pod Race, uh, Colton from the Nerdsmith Twitch channel, uh, and our friend Robin are all on that show. I also have another thing that you can find me at that's finally new as of several weeks ago, I can finally talk about. I am also launching a thriller series on currently on Amazon. Uh, It's currently exclusive to Amazon Kindle, but I am launching a gay thriller series set in a porn studio. Oh. Yes. It is called Beach House Studios. The beach house is one word with one H. And if you like very problematic people doing horrible things and suffering terrible consequences for it boy do i have the series for you uh bradley you've you've read a little bit of it you haven't read the the first book but as of recording this it drops january 31st so it will have been out gotcha yeah no i've uh i received an advanced copy uh review copy and i have read at least the first and a half chapter of the book without spoiling anything and you know, giving a vague review without going too much into detail because I want you to go get the book and read it. People on Book Talk who say like red, white, and royal blue is spicy or like all these gay novels are spicy. No, Charles has finally given <laughs> the people an actual spicy book. When these people say spicy, they mean like, oh, they made out or something like and they're gay. Yeah, they're both boys and they kiss. Ooh, that's spicy. No. Y'all, this is the spiciest shit ever. Okay. Actual. I, I will clarify. Is good. I will clarify. To be clear, the book itself is not 
erotica, but it is very spicy. Right. It is exactly. Very it's not spicy. meant to be. I'm sorry. I, I should clarify. It's not meant to be smut. It just has intercourse in it, which is why it's spicy. Okay. So like, there's a not... big old content warning at the front, which you should right. read if you're going to read this. But it's it's you know it's sexy. It might be a little murderous. So I don't know. I haven't gotten that far yet. But we'll see. Yet. We'll see Bradley's journey over the course of this. But yes, that is that is launched. Uh, again, Beach House Studios. The Beach House is one word with one H in the middle. Uh, but you can also search for C.W. Rogers is the, the pen name that I'm using to publish it, as well as you can search LGBTQ plus thrillers and it should pop up on the first page. Uh, so if that if that sounds like something you would be interested in, definitely go check that out. And Bradley, we will be back next week with Ahsoka, some words, run the socials. Thank you for listening to this episode of Gold Squadron Gays. Did Charles fuck something up? Email us at goldsquadrongays at gmail.com to let us know. You can also find us on Twitter at at goldsquadgays, and you can find us on TikTok and Instagram at at goldsquadrongays. You can also find us on YouTube at our Gold Squadron Gays YouTube channel, where we post full episodes of this show. Finally, if you liked the show, don't forget to rate us and give us a review on your favorite podcast platform. That allows other people to find our show. As always, thank you for listening to Gold Squadron Gaze, and we'll see you next week.